you're watching California Edition, I'm Brad Palmer, and I'm glad you're with us today. On this half hour, we'll be speaking with Jim Patterson. He's a member of the Board of Supervisors in San Luis Obispo County. He is leaving the board after eight years. We'll take a look back. We'll also be speaking with the Police Chief of San Luis Obispo. He'll be speaking about homeless issues, and I know Mr. Patterson will speak about those as well. And then we'll talk to Chris Unger, a member of the San Luis Coastal Unified School Board. In fact, he's president of that board. But first, we speak with Jim Patterson. Congratulations on a very successful eight-year term, one can argue. And I thought we'd take this time to look back over the last eight years and talk about um, what you've accomplished. So, sir, we congratulate you. Talk to us about some of your most proud accomplishments. Well, thank you, Brad, for that opportunity. I really appreciate it. Um, I do feel like I've had a successful two terms, a total of eight years. Um, I ran on a platform that... Uh, talked about resource management, resource preservation, um, public access to government being involved in my um, um, district. And uh, I've done those things, affordable housing, we put policies in place. And it, let's, it's been good. Yeah, and let's break down okay. some of those. We can talk about accessibility. I know you opened office hours, for example, in some communities that previously had felt that they were being ignored. Is that fair? Th that's right. I hold regular office hours in Atascadero, Santa Margarita, and Creston. I created a new advisory council um, out in Creston to give those people um, a larger voice in land use planning issues that are occurring in their community. And uh, also, I've held a number of workshops uh, over the years when there were issues impacting communities. I'd hold a, a town hall meeting, really, to educate the community about uh, issues. And it's really worked out very, very well. And I know one of those issues has been water. We know that gold is not worth fighting over, water is. And so over the last eight years, water has been a hot button issue. Talk to me about how you've addressed water management issues. Well, one of the things that we've done countywide, and Brad, uh, you uh, pick any one of a number of water issues, and we have it here in San no Luis Obispo County. Um, we have, in the past year, completed our uh, county master water plan, which identifies all of our water resources here in the county, projects future, future demand for water, and talks about the various deficiencies we have and things that we need to do to address those. Oh. And so that was, that was a real plus in getting that done. Also, we've determined um, that the uh, Paso Robles Groundwater Basin, which su supplies both uh, the communities of uh, Paso Robles, Atascadero, and Templeton, as well as the rural residents and agriculture in the North County, with their water, we're reaching the safe annual yield of that basin. So we, with a uh, stakeholder group of individuals using that water supply, a water management plan for the basin. It's voluntary, uh, but we're hoping that we can implement that and, and really get people to help us better manage that basin so we don't go into overdraft. Also, just last year, I want to point out uh, we completed the uh, $200 million uh, Nacimento project, which brings uh, water from Nacimento Lake to Paso Robles, Templeton, Atascadero, uh, the city of San Luis Obispo, and some county facilities. So you that's built. Sure. Now, in terms of the Paso Robles Groundwater Basin Management Plan, that has been somewhat controversial, as you know. And so... How do you look at the future sustainability of that plan? I and mean, there have been talks about whether it can survive a new member. What's your sense on that? Well, it is voluntary, Brad, and uh, it'll only be successful if people begin to implement it. Um, and I think that we've got a good group at the table now. There were some folks that were upset about measures that the county took in terms of land use. Uh, our goal in doing that, and we did uh, adopt a plan that would um, prohibit any additional uh, land subdivisions or general plan amendments over the basin that would potentially increase the water use. It's the only thing that the county can do. And that was also quite controversial. Fair yes, enough. That, well, some people thought that w we shouldn't be doing that. Um, but at the same time, uh, we've got all the stakeholders at the table, we've got a whole uh, array or a whole menu of possible strategies to uh, preserve the basin, stabilize it, and keep from going over into overdraft. And the challenge is that if we don't do that and the basin goes into overdraft, 
then litigation starts and the court comes in and regulates the basin, we lose control. That's happened in the South County right. with the Nacimento, or excuse me, with the Napomo Mesa area. And I'm told that uh, stakeholders down there have spent over $15 million in the last five years litigating water in that basin. And speaking of litigation, there has been litigation over the county's adopted smart growth policies. Uh, in that instance, the litigation has been successful in the county's favor. But talk to us about that fight that you had over the last, I guess it was your last term. Well, um, basically it's our land use element and incorporating strategic growth principles into our land use element. We were challenged by a group uh, called CoLab. Uh, it's a coalition of ag, labor, and um, business, I think they call themselves, yet we don't know who the ag people are, the labor people are, the business people are. Right. They've never identified themselves. They challenged us on the grounds that we should have completed uh, an environmental impact report before implementing the, the uh, smart growth principles in our land use element. But and so both the Superior that. Court and the Appellate Court ruled in the county's favor um, those strategies won't be implemented unless there are adequate resources um, and services available. And, and, and some found that uh, position a bit ironic, given that the CoLab folks are known for supporting property rights and EIRs have been seen as an anathema to property rights. Am I correct? Yes, but it's used by both sides as a way of, you know, attacking something they don't necessarily uh, like the outcome of, but we, we felt that we had it right. Uh, we were challenged and both the Superior Court and the Appellate Court said, County, you did it right, you've got it covered, move forward. At the same time, your last term has been very difficult for the county, for all counties in California. We had a severe economic downturn. San Luis Obispo has done better than the other 57 counties. I think it's fair to say a lower unemployment rate. But that being said, you did face budget crises after budget crises. But I know that you're proud of the fact that under your tutelage over the last couple of years, there have been no layoffs at the county and you continue to have a balanced budget. We do, Brad, and I am very proud of the way the county has worked together. Um, we've balanced our budget without a single layoff. We've downsized uh, both uh, our county workforce uh, as well as the cost of county government uh, about 10 percent uh, without a significant reduction in services. And we've implemented a second um, tier pension program for new right. hires. It saved us about $700,000 last year. And, and, and did that through collective bargaining, which says a lot. Some, right. And, well, and, and kudos to our workforce. I right. mean, they were at the table the whole way and they worked with us. Um, the reason we didn't have layoffs is because the workers, the county employees, took concessions to keep their colleagues working until we were able, through attrition, to um, balance our budget. One of the issues that you have focused upon over the last eight years has been protecting and serving the homeless. I know you intend to continue on that path. Why? Well, I, I think it's important. You know, it's um, a county, uh, as you know, you're here uh, mm -hmm. at, least, enjoying very much. At, at least once a month mm -hmm. and people want to live here and they deserve to be able to live here. And one of the issues I ran on was uh, lack of affordable housing. We needed more affordable housing uh, in this county, and we've made some progress in that direction through a number of policies that we've adopted in the uh, last few years. In fact, our housing element won a statewide planning mm -hmm. award. And um, the homeless issue, um, in part, Brad, is a function of the lack of an affordable housing right. in this county. And we, um, through, again, a group of stakeholders, service organizations, and agencies uh, put together a 10-year plan to end homelessness, chronic homelessness, and the Board of Supervisors established a, an advisory body called the Homeless Services Oversight Council. I'm the current chair of that council. I am sure you will remain involved in and that we issue plan and to. many more. Absolutely. When we come back, we'll be speaking with the police chief of San Luis City about the homeless issue in this area. I'm Brad Palmer, and we'll be right back. 
Welcome back to California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We are now joined by Steve Gazelle. He is the Chief of Police in San Luis Obispo, and he has brought today Derek Johnson, who's the Community Development Director in San Luis Obispo as well. And I'm surprised that we'll be talking about homelessness. As you know, San Luis Obispo has been deemed the happiest place in North America. I recently spoke with Jan Marks. You have about 98% of the people that are satisfied with San Luis Obispo. Of course, she is the mayor of this city. But in a recent community survey, it found that the point of concern at the highest level is homelessness. San Luis Obispo residents are concerned about the homeless. Why is that? Absolutely, and, and again, it's a pleasure to be here, Brad. Please. Um, homeless, as you said, is a, is a top concern in our community, the homeless population. Um, I've been the chief since January right. of this year, and this has clearly been the top issue in the community and top issue for, for me personally. And, and there's been a lot of consternation. I know back in February there had been some arrests of, from, of people who were was it sleeping in their cars, and so that caused some, some concern. Was that the right approach? The city council adopted a different approach based upon one that came out of Santa Barbara from where you had resided for many years. Yeah, there was a model down in, in Santa Barbara uh, County that was a partnership between the city of Santa Barbara and the county where they developed a safe uh, parking program. And that program is really designed to help people transition out of homelessness in, into a vehicle and hopefully into a job and, and right. permanent housing. And the Prado Day program has been successful at some level, not a lot of parking spaces available. But what's interesting about that program is that in order to participate, the homeless individuals need to agree to engage in services. And that's really why we're here today to talk about the homeless population. Because I think it's fair to say that individuals don't have a real sense of who the homeless are. They may have one view, but it really is very different from that. Derek, why don't you talk to us about the homeless population in San Luis Obispo, which I believe is probably a microcosm of homelessness generally. You know, in, in San Luis Obispo, we really thought about a model for and to help the public really understand the homeless uh, population in our community. And through a collaborative effort with nonprofits and the county social service providers, we really come to the conclusion that there are really three segments of the homeless population. We have the, the ready or the want to's. Those are individuals who want to access services, are in a position where they're re ready to sustain and engage in changes in their lives. People, for example, that will participate in the Prado parking program. Ready to participate in the Prado uh, program and willing to be engaged with a case manager to work on goals and steps right. to transition away from homelessness. But what's so interesting, Derek and uh, Chief Gazelle, is that I think people wouldn't realize that only 20% of the homeless population can be classified as, quote, ready. And that's based upon information we've received from the service providers. A small segment is actually engaged in case management and has actually enrolled in programs to make those positive changes, to look on workforce uh, and, and training. Chief, does that surprise you that such a small number are interested in services, only 20%? You know, it's absolutely been an educational experience for me over the last 10 months, and initially, yeah, that did come as a surprise. And I believe, generally speaking, we've made some significant strides in our community and some very effective dialogue throughout the mm -hmm. business community, neighborhoods, um, and taking really this message out there. And I, what we found is the general public, still at this point, we believe um, the majority of the public thinks that the, the vast majority of the homeless population is this 20%. And it's not. And it is not. And we know that it's important for law enforcement to get a handle on this issue because as I understand it, uh, the majority of at least your daytime arrests focus upon the homeless. It's not that you're seeking to cause trouble for them, but th that's where you're being called, is homeless uh, being involved in nefarious activity, allegedly. Absolutely, Brad. In, in, in our daytime period, which we classify 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., around 30% of our calls for service are transient related. So it's a plurality. Be, it's at a disturbing, level, right? absolutely. So let's go to the second population. And that is one that is classified as unable. 
And that's a pretty big number. Yeah, roughly 40% of the homeless population, we believe, is unable. And those are individuals that be due to mental or uh, various different types of dependencies, are, can't act services, unable to sustain enrollment in services, so they're not in a, really in a position to make the meaningful changes in their lives. So, but what, what do you do with those folks? I mean, are, do these people need to be, and I don't use this term pejoratively, institutionalized? Well, this is really where the collaborative effort has really seen some strides and where we've been working with the county to bring additional resources to the table. And that's in the form of caseworkers and additional programs that we eventually want to consolidate in a homeless services center. Now, here is a population I think is probably frustrating for both of you, and that is the last 40% resistant. So they could access services, but they're not. They don't want to. In, the, in this particular population, the, this is probably the population that the, the, the common public person has kind of interaction with. Mm -hmm. uh, they're down uh, in downtown San Luis Obispo, various but different parts of the city, engaged in panhandling. They may have had some different uh, type of interaction with them, and that's uh, bit maybe been negative, and that's one where the, oh, the social service providers and law enforcement really struggle to make some change. And as I understand it, Chief, a lot a lot of these folks, whether they're ready, unable, or resistant, are not native to San Luis Obispo. That's, that's correct. Another misconception, common misconception, is that um, the majority of our homeless population is indigenous or they're residents of San Luis Obispo or San Luis Obispo County. And what we know now is uh, approximately 70% of those that draw police contact, primarily in this last group that the we resistant. call the resistant group. 70% of those have recently arrived here. From where and, and why do they, I mean, there are certain communities, I don't mean to cast aspersions, but Santa Monica, for example, sure. I mean, it's known to be, sure. I mean, homeless are welcome. And it's not right. that Santa Luis Obispo is hostile to homeless, but it's, I don't know it to be a location that is welcoming homeless population. Yeah, they're, they're, and to answer your question, Brad, they're coming from all over the United States. But why San Luis Obispo do we know? Well, I think San Luis Obispo is one of the multiple cities in the state of California that uh, may be seen as receptive to certain lifestyles and supporting certain lifestyles. And I think every individual has a different reason sure. for coming. I think the, the more important factor is, is to get the information out that they are coming. And it's, it's absolutely a strain on the community, any community, particularly right. one of resident population of 45,000. It really strains city resources and, and the community as well. So Derek, let's talk about this resistant population because I know you provide us with these graphs. Your goal is to decrease the size of the resistant population. You can't do much about unable, although you, you probably could, but you're working toward it. But resistant is obviously the first target. Well, we really, right now, our, our focus is, you know, what, and what, what can we do about actually the unable population? Oh, that, oh really? Because we, our sense is that we can have somewhat of a dent on that. Oh, uh, I see what you're saying. Population. Right, because if you're resistant, you're fighting it. But if you're unable, but you can get them to able, maybe they'll join ready. And that's case workers who can work with them on uh, either medication through uh, case management and get them to a point where they can sustain and engage in, in services that that result in meaningful, long-lasting change. The resistant population, that is one where really we have found that uh, if it is individuals who are coming from outside the area, the way to impact that population, a lot of time the way for someone who's in the resistant population to have actual change is to bring them back to the community where they came from. Mm. If they have a social support system, sure. if they have a network of care, they're more likely to, to understand and engage in some side of, uh, of, of change. I have to ask both of you, what should we do wherever we may be if we encounter someone who is homeless? I'm not saying that they're approaching us in a violent way, but I, I'm always kind of flummoxed. I don't know what to say. Should I give them a dollar? Should I give, what do I do? Well, that's a personal choice, Brad, right. and, and I can tell you we have a huge, huge concern with panhandling in our, in our downtown area. Our merchants have struggled with this right. issue for years, and this is another example of the collaboration that, that goes on in this particular community of San Luis Obispo, a very invested city. But I, I have heard that giving them a dollar is not the right thing well, to do. It's not that, a wise thing to and do. And that's the point I want to make, is yeah. what other cities have done in the direction we'd like to see San Luis Obispo go is, when you give that money to the panhandler, you have no idea where it's going. And generally speaking, 
the consensus is that most of these are the resistant population right. that are down there. So what we would we would suggest is if you really want to give, give to the organizations exactly. where you know your money Service is providers. going to make a difference. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining us. My name is Brad Palmer. So when we come back, we'll be speaking with Chris Unger. He is on the school board at San Luis Coastal Unified School District. We'll be right back. According to a 2012 census report, how many Americans were living below the federal poverty line in 2011? Seven and a half, 10, 15, or 18 percent? The Census Bureau reports that in 2011, 15 percent of Americans were living below the federal poverty line. Welcome back to California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We are joined by Chris Unger. He is the president of the San Luis Coastal Unified School Board, and I thank you for joining us. And I can't believe we are talking to a school board president about Diablo Canyon. That's right. Yeah. One of two nuclear power plants in our state. Mm -hmm. Why is Diablo Canyon important to San Luis Coastal? Well, it's important because of the property tax. Plain Actually, and simple. Plain and simple. It's important because of the tax revenue that it provides, not only for the school district, but for the county. Um, oh, just you, be parochial. Tell us about the school district. <laughs> just tell us how important it is to I'll the tell, school district. Well, it is very important. And one of the reasons it's so important is not just the value of the property tax itself on Diablo. We look at a little bit more than that. Remember we talked about basic aid and what, what puts us into the basic aid and school what district what basic status. aid means, remind our viewers. Right, what basic aid means is that our amount of property tax revenue that the state says we have locally exceeds what the state funding would be for us. And we get to keep all right. of that. Of course, um, just a reminder to people that uh, with the state uh, financial problems, they take that back. Yes. And we pay our fair share of pain. But that said, let's get back to Diablo. And so there's something called the unitary tax in California. And my understanding of the unitary tax is that it not only looks at the value of Diablo, the value of Diablo's land, but it also looks at the value of the property that PG&E has throughout California. In addition to the power lines that go through our school district as right. well. So we get tax revenue on all of that. Diablo Canyon is the largest payer of property tax in this county. Mm -hmm. It has the most employers right. in this county, I believe. I mean, yeah. it is a major economic driver. Absolutely. But the reason why it's in the news is, as you know, there was, oh, a little earthquake in Japan. Just, yeah, right, exactly. Just a little one. And as right. a result, when we saw the Fukushima nuclear mm -hmm. plant almost go into meltdown, right? Uh, that caused a lot of concern, and so there has been a drive to have pg e the owner of Diablo, engage in some seismic tests. Because four years ago, there was a fault found, a second fault, there's the right. Hosgri, and now there's the shoreline. But as we speak today, uh, there's some concern about the scope of the test. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I, we absolutely have an interest in making sure that the plant's safe, and making sure that if the plant is safe, then our kids are going to be safe. It, it's but, an interest, well, uh, it, you know, and, and so that's that. The safety is really our main concern. It's interesting we talked about that because Diablo Canyon has regular emergency drills with the County of San Luis Obispo, where they, where they do scenarios right, sure. of nuclear radiation and, releases. And haven't you been to a few of those? I in the past? did. Right in October. Right. I was the acting county office of education uh, public information officer and so they have a, a rapid fire scenario where uh, in, in this case it was a plane crashing into a transformer at Diablo oh which caused problems with the diesel generators there sound like Fukushima it right? does absolutely and uh, release of radiation and so what we talk about is uh, what do you what do you do when that happens? Well, the, one of the first things we do is we in in San Luis Obispo County we hear the sirens, right. and what the sirens mean is you turn on your radio, right. and then you get directions. Well, for schools we have some choices. Do are we worried about whether there's a radiation leak? If it looks like that's going to be imminent, then do we relocate students? And where do we relocate students to? Well, we have to relocate them someplace safe. But how, what, what's safe when there's a radiation leak? Well, what I mean, they... Is Nevada? I mean, what, <laughs> it, honestly, what's safe? Radiation moves. Well, it, you're right. And, and that was one of the interesting things that I learned is there are meteorologists 
uh, who look at wind patterns oh, and right. weather patterns. And one of the major concerns we have is which way is the wind blowing? Right. Well, the wind in that area typically blows from the north to the south. Okay, uh, so starts driving north? So it actually starts driving south. No, but we should start driving north? Yes. Right. Well, what we, what we know is that if, you, if the schools have to be relocated in San Luis Coastal, they go up to the fairgrounds in Paso Robles. Right. Now, if there are schools in the southern part of the county, Lucia Mar School District, for example, right. they go south and they either go to Napomo High School, uh, which is in southern San Luis Obispo County, or there's that, another relocation center in San But is that Sanremo. far enough? I mean... Well, again, it depends on what, what the wind patterns are. One would hope so. The other alternative, or another alternative, right. is what they call sheltering in place, which go means underground. that you don't go anywhere. You seal your doors and your windows. Oh, I see. You don't go outside at all. Does so that those help? are some other options. Yeah, because then the outside environment isn't getting into your Truly? classroom or your house. I mean, well, radiation, will it go through walls? That, you know, the, I, I can only tell you what they told me. And is they that said no. They said that sheltering in place, if you can't go outside, is the next safest thing to do. It's scary. It's, it's really scary. But, but here's the thing. What's yeah. nice to hear is that you're taking steps to prepare. You're taking oh, precautions. Yes. And so that at least is gratifying, at least to me as a parent. Well, and you know, and it's more than just that. Uh, I, I will tell you that uh, we did a drill in October. There will mm -hmm. be another drill coming up shortly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And these drills are, are uh, they're evaluated by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So there are people watching to see the response. Uh, it's all of San Luis Obispo County's emergency services. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about the Highway Patrol. We're talking right. about Caltrans. Um, all of those folks are involved. Right. It's in integrated. It. It's, it's integrated, integrated and it has to be. Right. But I think for San Luis Obispo County, one of the other things we need to think about is, what about other natural disasters? And so, in, in a well, way... I mean, we think about what happened with Japan, and right. not far north from here, the tsunami hit mm -hmm. here. Was right. it Crescent City, is that right? Well, there was a, the tsunami in Crescent City, right. and the most recent one uh, did some really major damage to Santa Cruz. I think there was some damage done to San Francisco. Right. There was a little damage in Morro Bay. So we know... Right, Morro Bay did have some. I remember that, Morro yes. Bay had some damage. Uh -huh. And so this, if we think about it, having the nuclear power plant has forced us to look at emergency reaction, not only for what could be a nuclear meltdown, but, but I think more likely an earthquake, a tsunami. Right. You know, we'd, fortunately we don't get hurricanes here like we've right. seen in the yes. East Coast. But those are tremendous natural disasters. Now, you must be pleased there was not a meltdown on API scores we were for pleased. San Luis we Coastal. Were pleased. Yes, that sir. That was great. They just came out, uh -huh. and a score of above 800 is yeah. seen as mm -hmm. a positive move. And yeah. overall, your scores were 875 for the entire district, mm -hmm. up 11 points from right. last year. Again, in the time of budget cuts, to see you know, these scores mm -hmm. rising makes you wonder, what are you doing right? Well, we think we're doing a lot of things right. I think one of the things as a school board member that we do, mm -hmm. and I think this talks to the leadership of the district, is we put our money where our mouths are. Not a lot and of money to put where your mouth is. Not a lot of money to put, but what, what we want to do is we want to target that money in things that we think are going to be helpful to kids. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's the first thing we've done. We've really focused on looking at what is it that helps kids learn, and then what is it that helps our teachers help kids to learn. But some would say that scores have been rising throughout the state, not because of smart practices, but because of teaching to the test. Right. And we know that that's a concern. And again, we know that the, that the way the tests are constructed now, the multiple choice tests, can lead to that. And, and as we've talked to before, this idea of what, what is it that you're looking at for accountability? Are you just looking at test scores? Well then, yeah, people are gonna teach to the test, I think, I think we know that, and people are gonna tend to cheat. But as we've spoken about recently, there is some reform, at least in the API side. Correct. And so API test scores, or API scores will not be solely a function of the ultimate test, the star right. test, for example. Mm -hmm. And so you believe that's a net positive, I would presume? Sure, I absolutely do. And, and, and well, we've talked before about 
the common core standards and what that's going to mean for what I would almost call a reformation of the CST, the California standards. Right. And, and, when, and do those, when do those standards change? 2014. So we have a little time, but right. in the final analysis, it does appear that throughout the state, API scores are heading in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And with API reform not focused exclusively on the test, we will see a more I don't know, integrated approach to evaluating schools and students. And that's what I hope for, a more balanced approach. I think that's going to be so important because we don't want kids that can just take tests, that can just take multiple choice tests. Okay, his name is Chris Unger. He is the president of the San Luis Coastal Unified School Board. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We thank you so much for watching California Edition.